and give us their perspective, give us their in-class perspective of what is happening with code throughout their one-to-one deployment. So as I say, we will be having three workshops and they're going to be with progressive workshops. We're going to look at having uh, a few options, a few different things going through. We're going to look at how we might get started with the computational thinking side of things. Then we'll look at how that would then transition into command sequences and everything of that nature. And then finally, we're actually going to look at how we can start to bring in some app prototyping and app design work as we start to go through. So as I said, this is uh, done in uh, kind of cooperation with the Apple Regional Training Centres. Um, even though I'm part of the digi digital learning team at Education Scotland, I'm also what's called an Apple Professional Learning Specialist. So it means I, I have the opportunity to work with the, you know, as, as well as what I do with Educational Scotland, I've also got this ability to um, reach out that bit further into some of the other um, education communities that are garnered around using uh, using code, using iPad, teaching and learning. My background is maths and computer science. I realise some of you on the call may not know who I am. My name is Martin Coots. I am, uh, I've recently joined the uh, digital learning team. I started life as a maths and computing teacher at a secondary level, but I also work as uh, developing digital skills at the primary level. So I've been quite fortunate that I've had a chance to, to work across both sectors, as well as working with local authorities, um, both nationally um, and wider field, to help develop their skills in the learning and teaching around the use of technologies. So we've had that bit of a, a welcome and introduction. Um, we are going to use the chat pane a bit, uh, a bit today. We're going to use that as much as possible. It is going to be a bit interactive at times. I'm going to get you guys to, to share a few things in the chat pane, just a couple of, um, couple of thoughts, observations, things of that nature. Uh, one of the, the first things that we'll do after we speak to Susan is that we're actually, and if I've got this wrong, Susan, you can kick me for it, um, but we're um, delighted to be joined by Susan Ward, who is the head teacher at Kingsland Primary School down in the Borders. And uh, Susan is going to take, I've, I've actually, I've got a stick as well that I've been told that I'm allowed to use if she goes over the 10 minute mark to kind of pull her away from, uh, from, from talking. I think what you'll begin to find is that we are both very passionate around developing computational thinking when it comes to uh, getting students to think about how they're going to solve problems. So I'm absolutely delighted that Susan is going to share her uh, perspective and experiences and the things that have been going on. Was that a good enough introduction there, Susan? Was that, uh, you, you gave me a fiver, so I don't know if that was, if that was enough <laughs> or if you needed a bit more. But Susan, that thank you so much. Unmarked. Thank go you so much. Go. And I'll pass over to you for the next, wee, the next few minutes. Thank you. Hi everyone. Yep, Martin said there. My name's Susan Ward. So I am head teacher at Kingsland Primary School. Um, brand new head teacher. I hasten to add. I took up post on the nineteenth of April. So prior to that, I was deputy here at Kingsland, and prior to that, I was principal teacher here at Kingsland. So I've been in the border since two thousand and twelve, and I've been here at Kingsland since twenty fourteen. Um, and really. What I've been asked to do today is to come along at the start of this Get Into Code um, progression of webinars, as Martin has said, and um, share with you a little bit about um, the approach that we've taken in the borders, the approach that we've taken specifically at Kingsland, um, and really set the scene, I suppose, a little bit about what um, where we began and what we did when we were first starting to consider getting into code. Um, so that's what I'm going to try to endeavour to do in 10 minutes or less, Martin, lest the stick be um, used. <laughs> I will try to try to keep myself very measured. Um, so really, I, I suppose the first thing I would like to say is that um, I do not have a coding background. Um, I don't have a computing science background. Um, my teachers from high school would think it was hilarious that I had involved myself in this way with a digital approach. So I am not coming to this um, with any particular skill set. I've always been interested in digital um, and right from early in my career, I always felt as if there was potential there and there were ways that we could be using digital to make learning experiences for children better. Um, so that's really where I began with it. And in terms of um, computing science, I would say I came to that a little bit later. Um, and for me, my first introduction to it was that idea of code and getting children coding. And there was a lot of talk 
probably five or six years ago now um, about teachers and particularly teachers in primary school getting children coding um, and this big focus on the idea of coding. So I want to just talk you through um, where we've come from, I suppose, um, in our thinking around that. So really, first and foremost, what I'd like to say is at Kingsland, we have taken an approach to computing science that isn't driven by coding. Um, Martin and I had a, a, a good chat, didn't we, last week, and we were talking about um, this very idea of what actually is computing science, what comes first, and it isn't coding. Coding's a good bit down the road. The first thing that we need to do is we have to really embed computational thinking for children right from their very early days as learners. So it's not about us hitting primary four or five um, and thinking, OK, we're going to get on with some coding here. There's a whole um, progression of skills that has to go in before you reach that point. Um, because for me, computational thinking is a way of looking at the world. Um, it is much broader than just coding. Um, and really, when you dig right into it, and I'll talk to you a little about how we use the benchmarks and how that's helped us shape what we've done here. Um, but really, when you look at the benchmarks and you, you start to get interested in computing science as a curricular area, computing science is about careful attention to a problem and the curious and methodical pursuit of an effective solution. That's my little um, trademark definition. You can all have that if you would like it. I'll say it again. Computing science is about careful attention to a problem and the curious and the effective solution. I love that has gone is, and I think if you take nothing else away from this series of webinars, that would be the one thing I would want you to really grasp um, because diving in at coding is sort of like jumping in halfway up the pool before we've even got our swimsuits and our trunks on or got our feet wet. Um, you really need to put the put those things in, in place first. So I'll take you back on a little story back to when the technologies benchmarks came in. Um, we've done quite a lot of work at Kingsland around um, digital and around the, the sort of digital literacy side of things, digital citizenship. And computing science was kind of the area where people were skirting around it and not too sure. And we had a wee bit of B-bots going on. There's always a wee bit of B-bots going on in primary schools, but it wasn't very methodical. Um, it wasn't very systematic. Nobody was very clear about the skills. And the first thing that I did was I did a, a benchmark, an audit of the benchmarks with teachers um, the new, when the new technologies benchmarks came in. And that's a really good place to start because that'll get all the anxieties people have out on the table. So for us, um, that was centred around the word algorithm. There was a few people that, um, you know, just nearly slipped off their chairs at the very idea of them having to understand what an algorithm was. So that got it out onto the table for us, everybody's um, anxieties and worries around it. And what I did was I linked that to the, the same sort of thinking as the way teachers are having to approach things like one plus two. You know, you don't need to be a curricular expert or an expert in a particular curricular area in primary. It's, it is that broad general education. And there are some um, aspects of different curriculums where you need that, that bit of knowledge. But actually, computing science is one where it links to lots of different curricular areas. So that was our next thing. After we got all our worries out on the table, it was, OK, how can we make meaningful links to other curricular areas? Start to help teachers to see... Um, how it could fit in with other things. And there are lots of um, lovely natural links that you will make between computing science benchmark and problem solving in maths. Um, there are links that will sit there that are quite comfortable and, and teachers make those. And when they started to do that, they started to see that um, it actually wasn't quite so scary. Uh, we took an unplugged approach right from the very beginning. And as I said, we didn't want to rush to coding. There was already some coding going on in the school quite a lot of it put there by me if I'm perfectly honest through little code clubs and that type of thing but as I say it wasn't systematic and it wasn't building skills it was putting children onto computers and letting them crack on you know letting them just work through the instructions and they quite enjoyed it um, but it didn't feel like it was methodical it didn't feel like we were building skills so we took this unplugged approach um, and we really focused on building the foundations first um, and the, the analogy I've got for you around that is that you know, we wouldn't expect a child who can't spell to suddenly write a novel. 
um, and that is the equivalent of jumping straight into code. And actually, if you look at the technologies benchmarks, look at the computing science ones and look at the organisers, they will support you in your pedagogy around that because it's all right there. They talk about it. It's not that you have to do organiser one, then two, then three. It's more of a spiral. But there is an expectation that there's an understanding of those fundamental concepts before children are starting to um, to use code in, as a language. Um, as I say, there is that temptation when confidence is quite low um, amongst teachers that they just put children onto games or put children onto code.org or one of these things and let them just get on with it. Um, and as I say, that was one of the things we had to really tackle because teachers were saying to me, um, but they know how to do it. They know better than me. You know, I don't, I don't know. They, they know. They're able to do it, and they're so fast. And, and some of that will be true because they're intuitive and they're not worried about it the way we are as adults. But actually, um, what I'll take you back to my definition, that careful attention to a problem and the curious and methodical pursuit of an effective solution, those are skills that have to be taught. Um, the technical skills of how to use Scratch or how to use a programming language, children possibly can pick up. But the, those skills that they need in order to attain the benchmarks have to be taught. Um, yeah, they need support. I'm paraphrasing my own notes. They need support to learn the skills necessary to plan, design, create and refine solutions. Um, to critically examine a problem and not just assume that the computer knows best. So for us, because we'd already, and you will know in your own school, in your own practice, um, other aspects of digital, how they're going. Because we'd spent a lot of time looking at digital citizenship, there was a natural link for me um, to computing science to be saying to teachers, well, actually, we want to empower our children to understand programming languages, to understand how the software they use is put together so that they can then create their own content. That's going to give them more agency um, as users of, of the internet when they grow and they get older. Um, so having a having a, a clear idea about how the work you're doing will benefit learners is quite important. And that will help you keep going when things are hard. Um, I'm going to take myself back a little bit to just explain a bit more about the unplugged idea and how that worked. Um, so we used lesson plans to begin with. We used a lot of the barefoot resources, which are super. Um, and this was in the days before, you know, everyone can code and, and the other things we've got that um, you're going to be exploring. But it's, I think it is important that there are lesson plans at the beginning. And there are lots of good lesson plans available. So you're not, your teachers aren't, or as teachers, you're not having to think up, right, where is the learning here? Or, or how do I teach it when I'm not too sure? Use the lesson plans because that will make sure that what you're teaching is progressive. Um, starting from the very beginning, we use tinkering. Um, to create curiosity around machines and how they work. So our nursery um, children in primary one have got tinker tables where they can take things apart um, and look inside them and see how they work and be curious about it. Um, and challenging as a, as a class or challenging in your classroom ethos or in your school, culture of your school, things about, oh, well, we'll just Google it. Well, OK, we might just Google it, but actually Google's using an algorithm and do we understand what an algorithm is? So it's like you're almost showing the children all the time. Um, humans are the smart ones here. It's not that the computers know. The humans have told the computers what to know. Um, so that that making all those little drippy, drippy tap um, comments really helps to build the culture in your school. Sorry to jump in there, Susan. I just want to... to I, I thought that was an absolutely brilliant point you just made there because I've experienced that with my own students when, you know, I've been working with them and we've been actually looking at developing their risk you know, so their research and information and how they're more they they're they're more inclined just to believe what they what they see on Google. They don't have that tendency. It's the same with Google Images, isn't it? They seem to think, you know, when you ask them where did they get that image? Oh Google Images. Uh, no, that's where you that's where you found it. That's not where you you know, so it's it it it's kind of taking that step back, isn't it? And it's looking at the 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 internet, the internet of things, or internet connected devices, and how they actually all kind of join into together. I, I think that's a, a really sort of good, a good point, and a good way to kind of make students take a step back and think about the bigger picture style of working. Yeah, and it can feel overwhelming, and I, and I want to put that on the table. You know, when you first, if you're coming to this for the first time considering how you are responding to these benchmarks or how you're going to move things forward in your classroom or in your school. 
it can feel overwhelming because you think, my goodness, where do I even get started? There's all that digital literacy stuff around, you know, rights and ownership. Then you've got all this computing science stuff that all feels very um, niche and it feels very um, content driven and you have to understand it. It can feel like it's all just a lot. So I think for me, I would really encourage you to just take that step back and think about what do your learners need? What do they need in order to survive and thrive in their digital world and put it at that level? And if you can embed as much of that in the culture of your classroom, every time you're used in an image um, for a piece of work, you're, you're challenging children on, well, where has that come from? And do we have permission to use it? Um, it's that dripping tap effect is equally as important. I know we're not here to talk about digital literacy today, and that will definitely make Martin employ the stick, so I will not go there. <laughs> the computing science side of it is actually the same. If you can make those meaningful links and help them to see how that careful pursuit, methodical pursuit of a solution um, is, is exactly what happens when you know the devices they're using, every, every interaction they have on a device happens because someone has taken that curious approach. They've taken a, a methodical approach to finding an effective solution to something. And that's when you see it's a sort of, um, you know, it's when you take, I don't know if it's the red pill or the blue pill in the matrix, but it's like once you see that, you can't unsee it and uh -huh. it your learners. And that's when the thing kind of really takes off. So don't feel overwhelmed and think, oh my goodness, where will I begin? And every bit of this will be new. Once you start talking and thinking in that way, your, your learners will too. And that, that's when the, the really good stuff starts to happen. Um, I'll just finish. I've only got a few other bits to go, Martin, I promise you. That's okay. To kind of summarise, you know, kind of um, where we had taken it. Um, so I've talked about that idea of making clear how it benefits learners. I'm not going to go on about that at length. As I say, the unplugged approach is really, really important um, and it's easy and it, it doesn't put a lot of pressure on you in terms of getting access to computers or access to devices or all that kind of thing um, and uh, you know showing that it's exciting and that you're in it together you're learning it together you know your energy and your enthusiasm for it will help children and um, to see why it's good and why it's fun um, a little bit about where we are in the borders so in the borders we have a project called inspire learning um, and through that there's been this rollout of one-to-one -one devices so it's ipads that we've got down this way and from primary four to S6 now all children have a one-to-one -one device and they're looking to put um, additional devices into primary one to three um, which is brilliant and in lots of ways that makes access to materials much easier and um, you know Martin's going to talk about everyone can code and, and how that fits in and, and how um, you know Apple as a platform um, for that coding approach is given that systematic um, kind of structure to what is being delivered um, but what I would say to you is it doesn't matter whether your class is one to one or whether your class is one to 33 or whether your class is you know one to half an hour in the computer suite once a fortnight and um, COVID dependent you know whatever situation you're in you can start from where you are and um, all of the early level most of the first level and some of the second level content um, for computing science can be delivered without any access to a device. So you don't have to wait to get started with this until um, you're one-to-one. -one. I would encourage you not to if you're um, in a local authority that's looking towards or working towards one-to-one. -to -one. Actually, you want to be laying the groundwork now. One of the things I'm really excited about is we're sort of um, we're kicking on for three, almost four years through now and um, so children we started with the tinker of tables and that type of thing in nursery um, are now almost about to hit primary four where we'll get a one-to-one -one device and for us that's going to be really interesting because what I would like to see is that our children are better equipped to engage with um, programming languages and some of that you know uh, so more sophisticated content than our primary fours were four years ago because we've built it in as a culture and we've We've built skills, and um, so it'll be interesting to see if that is what happens. There, there really needs to be a culture of computational thinking. That should be your goal, um, not can I get these children through X amount of code or can they do, you know, um, X number of puzzles or whatever it might happen to be. Um, I think you need to be, uh, certainly the feedback I've had from teachers is um, when they have been, when they've engaged with this way of working, it's, allowed, it's almost given them their agency back. 
it's made them think, well, actually, I do know this and I can, I do have a role here to teach. It's not just that they're all onto their computers and they're racing through and I don't know what's happening. Um, there is a real role for teaching in computing science if we want to make a good job of it. And um, we absolutely have to, we must, because that's how we'll equip our learners to do um, go on and do amazing things in the, the world that awaits them out with the school, on the other side of the school gates. Perfect. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, I love the fact that, that you're also talking about the fact that you're giving the the agency back to teachers. You're giving teachers this ability to actually have a vested interest in what computing science looks like. We're not just thinking about we're not just thinking about how this is also going to be similar to the fact that um, we're maybe talking about you know we're maybe talking about just having students go through and complete as many games as they can, and suddenly they've got a grasp on uh, suddenly they've got a grasp on how they can how they can take things on computing science and all of that type of thing. So it is a good way to get that um, uh, to get that kind of agency back. Yes, indeed, Scratch is a Scratch is a great resource. It works great on the iPad as well. I think the the what we are trying to get across here is it doesn't necessarily matter about the platform, but the thinking that goes behind it. You could be on Scratch, you could be on Swift, you could be in Python, you could be in Xcode, you can be in any, you could be in Tinker, any computing language at all. If you give students that understanding, if you give students that understanding of how to approach a task, how to break problems down, how to condense it all so that they can break it into bite-sized manageable chunks, then the platform almost becomes secondary to it. We are going to focus on some of the Everyone Can Code resources this uh, this afternoon. Um, and I, I know that some of you don't have access to the chat, which is or, uh, which is fine. What we'll do is we'll be uh, we'll be sending out uh, a few different resources. But we are going to look at some of the different things that you can do in terms of getting started with code, how you can see some of the simple activities that you can do, how you can try to apply them uh, using Swift Playgrounds, all of the, the stuff that's on uh, that's on the iPad. You could also actually see how this connects itself to what you're doing with other curricular areas. You know, coding and literacy actually go very hand in hand as we're going through. And then, you know, if we get a chance, you know, we'll show you some ways that you can share your success, some of the things you've been finding. And also, most importantly, because this is what happens in coding, is sharing your failures. You know, without having something that doesn't work, we don't know how to make it work. Debugging, beta testing, all of these types of things play into the connection. So I suppose the um, the, the first question, um, now you can do this if you have a secondary device, that's absolutely fine. But I suppose the first question would be, um, if you do have access to the chat, please do. If you want to come off mute to answer this one or put your hand up uh, to see if we could take this. If you were going to take a selfie and you were going to break those steps down, what would they look like? What would be the steps involved in order to take a selfie? If you had to think about something like this, using the using the, the camera app on your device, how would you take a selfie or how would you instruct someone else to take a selfie? And for those of you who don't know what a selfie is, that's a picture of yourself that you take. Right? It's not a picture of the trees, it's a picture of you. Or as my mum calls it, I was trying to take that picture over there, but I took a picture of myself by mistake. Okay, So that's what happens. But yes, if you're wanting to um, give it a go, if we get any volunteers, anybody that's feeling brave, remember this is coding, this is computational thinking, there is no such thing as a wrong answer. Oh, look at that, it's a Monday afternoon. Okay, I'm going to call. Oh, there we go. Nobody else will then. <laughs> please, please. Um, okay, so uh, take your device. I'll assume it's a mobile phone. Take your mobile phone. Yep. Switch it. To, make sure it's switched on and navigate to the home page. Okay. Yep. Find the camera app icon uh -huh. and open the camera app. Okay. Check that the camera uh, is. That, that you're seeing yourself on the screen and if not find the button to change the camera all right okay and then when you can see yourself in the picture press the photo button and you have a selfie nice nice absolutely and uh you can see in the 
Um, you can see in the in the chat there, Gregor said the same thing. Take out the device, open the camera, select front front facing, lift your arm. They apparently look better from above. Gregor, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. And take the picture. Excellent. Do we have someone else, Mrs. Cameron? Are you feeling uh, brave to tell us? Do you agree with that, or is there anything you would add? Nope, she's put herself on mute. Oh no, she's back again. No, no, that it was me. That, that oh, was that yourself? Sorry, sorry. I saw that there was uh, there was hands up. There's now we're getting so many people. I think it was it was someone else that was had their hand up that was wanting to see it, but that's okay. Mrs. Main, find the camera app, turn it on. Excellent. So we are getting that idea. Now, that could be an approach of this coding unplugged. Can children take everyday steps? Repeat until... Absolutely, Ashley. That's a great point. Repeat. You know, take it as much as you like. We are currently in the process of getting a kitten. And as we get the pictures of the kitten taken, it's, she's always moved. So we, we, said to the, uh, we said to the breeder, press and hold. Take the, the burst. And then you get multiple pictures. So sometimes it's not just doing something once. It's doing it multiple times. Now, if this was code, it might actually look like this. Function, take a selfie. Okay, so that's something that, that, you know, as you start to approach, what do you think these terms mean? Open camera, switch the view, smile. You know, no one, no one said that in there. Someone, I mean, Gregor kind of had it, but lift your arm. That's absolutely fine. But we forgot about smile. Tap the shutter. There we go. And then markup photo. That could be something that we've also said. Let's take our picture and we could write on it. So if this was a set of instructions, this would result in something that looks like this. OK, that's us taking a picture. We've smiled. We've used the markup tool. So we can actually see how commands can go together. And yes, the sandwich you are made to smile, yes. The sandwich activity is a great way. Another great one is brushing your teeth, right? Um, the, the fact that you have to repeat the process over and over, making a cup of tea. When I was introducing coding, and I, when I started with uh, the students at, uh, in our school, we would um, start with the B-bots activities, the moving forward, the left, the right, that type of thing. But as we were progressing and we did a, something a bit more complex, and we were going to be introducing something a bit more complex, we started with this. We started with things like hide and seek and all of these types of activities. Susan, your camera's back on. Have you got, are you wanting to chip in? Have you got a, a, a wee point to add there, or were you just happy with that? No, sorry. I, I was just, um, I had I had to put my camera off for a second. Just, <laughs> <You're back. just laughs> That's it. Back. How many of us have actually, yeah, yeah, how many of us in webinars have had to switch off our camera because we've either had to stretch or yeah. in my case, scratch. Yeah. We, you know, we've done that as well. Absolutely, absolutely. We were just kind of saying, you know, back at, about the points that you were talking about, about coding unplugged and how you would introduce code, is that, you know, you, we wouldn't even get near this until we had actually done something along the lines of the sandwich activity. Um, the sandwich activity is an absolutely brilliant one. That's a great one to share. Now, the essential skills that you can build in your students as we are working through this are things like creativity. You can be creative in your approach to solving a puzzle. You can be creative in your approach to finding a solution that works. Collaboration. We've just proven how collaboration is actually a great way to talk about how something works. And app developers love collaboration. How many of us have ever been asked to beta test or, or test an app before anyone else has? Because they're not doing that because you're going to get the you're going to get access to all of these resources before anybody else. It's so that they can actually find the bugs. They put it out to the wider community. There's that old adage: the further afield that you throw something out, the wider you're going to catch, the more you're going to find. Right. So the wider the wider afield you throw your problem, the easier as it is to solve. And as we start to de, you know, this decomposition, this problem solving, breaking it down into chunks, you know, people that are like, oh, wait a minute, I forgot to smile. Or wait a minute, I forgot to make a cup of tea. I actually forgot to put the water in. All of these types of things. Or you then get the arguments and the discussions. Wait a minute, my dad puts the milk in before the, 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 the hot water, you know, and, and suddenly you get all of this. Whoa, what is actually happening here? So all of this can happen before you even pick up the Swift Playgrounds or Scratch app or any of these types of apps, obviously we're talking about Swift Playgrounds today. So that coding unplugged, 
that ability to break problems down, to look at how it might build out into the wider field, into all of these different situations. There's some great resources out there. And the resources that are available for people who are doing things with iPad is what's called Everyone Can Code. And Everyone Can Code is this program of work. It's almost like a curricular of work. And I don't want to put uh, I don't want to put Susan on the spot, but I know Borders have actually been doing some work with the um, with the computing science and the digital skills E's and O's and how everyone can code can also tie into that. So there is work kind of going on out there just now where we're actually thinking about how the E's and O's plus you know, again, a, a curriculum like this can actually tie in together and can actually give you, right, when you're getting started, you might be doing some unplugged activities. So as you start to progress through and as you start to, to, to go into the more complex side of things, you can actually get a bit more detail as you're going through. So Everyone Can Code is actually, uh, it's, it's quite a comprehensive set of resources that are available. And it's not prescriptive it is almost like a guiding practice. You don't have to do it this way, but it's also, um, it's like a starter for 10 in a lot of cases. You might not necessarily know how you're going to get started with this, how you're going to break it down. You may think, as Susan said, that we're not a one-to-one -one authority. We can't get started. No, you can start to lay the groundwork. I taught in a school where it wasn't one-to-one. -one. It was a set of iPads that were used throughout. You know, you're, it doesn't matter whether every child it does, but it doesn't matter at the get-go early on that every child has a device right in front of them because the skills that you can develop, that collaboration, communication, the motivation that you can get them going with, you know, you can start coding clubs, you can do all of these different types of things, but having these resources available to you can be massively, massively uh, useful. They are massively fun, right? They are hugely fun. I had a, a, a coding club at school and we used the Everyone Can Code resources uh, for that. We used uh, the, Swift, uh, the Swift club and they were absolutely, absolutely engaging for all of the students that, that came along. They're quite flexible as well. So it's quite a good way where, again, it's not a prescriptive way. It's kind of like when you're looking at Scratch 3 and Scratch has got all of these lesson templates and all of these different plans. It's that same thing. But as Susan and I have been saying since we started, it's not just a case of picking up the app, working through the book and doing the, and you're not teaching them how to code. You're teaching them how to play a game, right? But as they progress through and as you progress through, because the teacher guide, you know, the great thing about the teacher guide is it actually has the solutions, right? It's also got the solutions. You don't need to be, you know, as Susan said, her background's not coding. And I'm sure as she has progressed through, her skill level has went from, I'm interested in code, I'm seeing how things go, but as I progress through, her skill level starts to go up, her confidence of teaching code goes up. Susan, would that be out of place saying that, or would that be, would, would, something, like, would, would something like these resources have helped you as someone who is a novice to teaching and using code? Yeah, definitely. And I was just, I was going to add there, Martin, the teaching books um, are brilliant for Everyone Can Code because there's lots of pedagogy in there. There's lots of what we've been talking about in terms of setting the scene and building the skills. And I think um, for me, when we'd been starting out, if we'd had Everyone Can Code and um, the iPads when we had started on this journey at Kingsland, it would have changed things in the sense that I think it would have given us a clearer pathway. We would still have started where we started and we would still have... Um, you know, building that computational thinking approach needs to happen first, but um, definitely the, the resources are really good, and I would urge everyone not to jump straight into the puzzles, which is what everyone wants to do. Yeah. Particularly if you dipped your toe in the water with the, um, through the Apple Teacher badge, um, you might think, oh, I know what I'm doing here. You need to really look at the teacher books um, and take it, their, their, take it a step at a time and, and use what's there um, to help you build the skills. Perfect. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it's not that... It's not jump in. Everybody wants to because suddenly, you know, they're doing development. But it's not about that. It's actually looking at what's in the guides and how you can get started with it. So the Everyone Can Code Teacher Guide actually has quite a lot of good resources. Remember I was talking about how I might get started with younger students and we might introduce that coding unplugged. A great activity for that um, is the hide and seek 
and there are resources that you can download with this. Let me take you into it in a little second. But what you can actually do is hide an object in the class. You could use um, you could use a bit of paper or you could use the iPad if you've got students with additional support needs who can't necessarily write or, or put their, their thoughts down. So uh, an activity like hide and seek can be done quite quite easily without sitting down at an iPad to get get with uh, to get started with. As the teacher, you could have the iPad with the activity if you've got uh, Apple TV or um, I think there's someone on from Bankery, so uh, Aberdeenshire, we've definitely got um, Apple TVs in, in some of the schools that are using iPads. So when you mirror and you've got the device connected to your smart board, you could have the activity up on the board. Students can see it. They can then go through and create the activity. Let me give you an example of how I did this. So a, a P4 class we were starting off with and I paired them up they started to work in pairs. And the activity was just this. It was hide and seek. In fact, it was something like buried treasure, um, where we would have them go and put the go and put the the you know like the marker. Like you know, they would get the marker pen, they would go and hide it. Then they had to record the instructions on how to find it. But they had to be clear in their instructions. We had to agree on what a step was. Was a step this massive unit or was it a normal step? You know, walk forward 49 steps when really it was walk forward six steps. And, you know, they were talking like little, you know, little Stewie Griffin from Family Guy steps where their feet are going really fast. So, again, you start to bring that discussion to students and they're beginning to think logically, right? What is a step? Is a step a leap or is a step a standard? You know, everyone's got different feet and different sizes. But if we say walk forward six steps, you're kind of going to get the gist of where they can they can work with it. As you create those instructions, you either give the iPad to um, the partner or if they are working with multiple iPads, you can airdrop the video. And then to test whether it works is that swap instructions. See if you can get to the hidden object. What I like about this activity is that there's reflection questions, right? Again, going back and, and asking themselves what worked what didn't work? What did you have to focus on? What were the important things? Could you say walk forward six steps sneakily? Would that have helped? Or could you say walk forward six steps? Stop. Turn right. Stop. Walk forward three steps. Stop. And yes, you end up getting a class of Pac-Man. You know, it, noise is optional. But you get students who are communicating, collaborating, thinking about how a process works but they are, from a young age, thinking like, you know, they're thinking like computers, if you like. They're thinking logically. And again, this brings it back to if we were to give these instructions to something that didn't understand nuance, that didn't understand, you know, little, um, little nuances that we have in our tones, walk forward a teeny bit, you know, a teeny bit more, turn left a smidge, duck down under there. You know, th those types of things. Are those types of things important or is it important to be accurate and right? So that activity is one that you can start to use. That's in the teacher guide. And you'll notice it doesn't even approach how you might um, do this within, within code. One that we could have is this is, you know, this leads into how we give commands. So again, Another activity that you can do with this, this is one that you can download and use from the book. It's all in the guide. When you open, there's a, a downloadable resource, a Keynote slide. I'm in Keynote just now. Keynote can be converted for working in PowerPoint. Obviously, we're talking about doing stuff on iPad. Keynote is um, iPad's presentation tool, but it's really a lot more. Keynote to me is, is more like the, 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 the one-stop shop for everything you need to do on, on the iPad. But you, again, you don't necessarily need to have the students using the iPad. All the resources are on the iPad, so it is easier. But you could then have them come up with how are they going to take it in turns to get from the canoe to the treasure. And we could record our commands. We could record our commands using, the, using the, the, um, our finger. There's a doodle option in Keynote, which I'll show you in a little second. So if I was to do this with a class, Here's our activity, all right? So you can see I've got grids. I've got a starting point, I've got an end point. 
So again, if you want to use the chat, that's absolutely fine. But why don't you take a couple of minutes to look at this and instead of... Um, first time I've reconnected this pencil because my iPad acted up the other day, apologies. So as we are um, doing this with students, you can see we've got the canoe down in the grid. Right? We could say this is this is familiar if you're doing blue bots or bee bots. This could be a natural progression, and you could say, right, go to go to go to square C four. Okay, now that's the the final space. Go to, go to square C four. But would um, would someone that has never seen an object like this would they understand that? Think of battleships. Think of that type of. That's a really good activity if you're doing Excel or or uh, numbers work with your students. You can teach computational thinking playing a game of battleship where you could say, you know, sell C4, you've sunk my battleship. Think about the, you know, it's a good way for them to think about coordinate systems, going horizontally, going vertically. You're bringing in maths, you're bringing in shape, position and movement. So I suppose the question I want to ask here is how many solutions can you see to get to the treasure? Is there solution? And again, if someone's feeling brave or want to put into the chat, if you're just wanting to think, if you're just wanting to approach this or think about how you might do a task like this, that's absolutely fine. So I suppose you know, we know what the solution is. The solution is move forward to, okay? So let me just come off this. I'm going to add in a drawing. We could say, right, move forward to. So that would take one, two, okay? Then we could say, turn left. If we look, talk, move forward, one, two, three. One, two, three. So we could be active in this. That's me just using my finger to move it. Of course, that's not the only solution. The, you know, another solution could be turn left. Move forward, three. One, two, three. Turn right. Move forward two. So we can find lots of different solutions, absolutely. But again, you can start to build that discussion with students. Is this the only solution? Is this the, the right solution? Is there a right solution? If I was wanting to stop at the tent first, could I do that? Of course, what we didn't see on my first solution was the he's in the he's on the he's on the river. OK, so he's on the river, obviously with a canoe. That makes more sense. My second solution, we had him, you know, you can start to younger students. You can just talk about turn left, move forward, turn right. Older students, you could talk about if, you know, you could say, right, what happens if he hits a tree? If he hits a tree, turn left. If he hits, um, if he hits grass, stop, wait. So you can actually start to introduce, you know, all of these different functions and commands and groups and loops and all of these types of things as you progress through. You don't need to introduce it all on a one which as they just move through on their own, they get hit with all of these things that they don't understand. And if we were to see them just sitting there and just playing with the app or just using, you know, Tinker's quite bad for this. It's a great app. But it's, it's really just trial and error. We see the students just going through and just trying everything until it works. We don't necessarily see them thinking about why does it work this way? Why have we done it this way? Asking that question that many programmers, many coders, many developers ask themselves when they're sitting there after compiling one million lines of code, why? You know, that's that, that comes into it in a big, big way. So... Hopefully you can see that unplugged, getting started with unplugged sessions is actually quite a good way to have students thinking about how they're going to bring in commands and how they're going to start with actual code when they go through. And that's when we switch over to Learn to Code 1.
which is one of the first activities that you download. Now, this might be two or three lessons that you've done before you've even went close to the um, before you've even went close to the Everyone Can Code resources um, and Swift playgrounds, because all of these different aspects. What's quite, what what I love about the um, about the Everyone Can Code puzzles teacher guide and student guide is it breaks them down, breaks it down into apply, try, learn. There's these different headings that you can understand. So you can see if we go into Apple Books, there are four. We're just dealing with the, the puzzles guide just now. So when you're in the puzzle guide, things can be broken down. You can see if we go to the contents, you can start with the introduction, which is essentially what we've just been doing. Right? You can see any of these blue uh, links are how you can actually start to download. And this is the teacher uh, side of things. This is showing you how you might want to use them, right? There's, as you see there, it says about 40 to 45 uh, hours of coding. There can be a lot more depending on how you break it down. You might find that you need to go over commands a couple of times. It's all there to help you kind of get started. And as I say, they're broken down into four sections. Learn, try, apply, and connect. So as you're learning it, and they're all color-coded, so you can see as we go through, I'll take you into Swift Playgrounds in a second, and how you might then make that connection as you move through. So we identify the goal, we think about, um, we experiment, we test, and we also learn the syntax, right? It's a good idea to have pupils thinking about what does the word command mean? What is the word if for? What is a loop? Why do we look at these different things? And it's a good idea early on to have them, you know, not get confused. I've given you a command. No, you've actually given me an instruction, which is, you know, you're, you're having them think about how it might be different. The different wording might be slightly different. And it's all about that critical thinking. It's all about that approach and how they might start to take things. And of course, the applying connect as you go through. So we've got the, the kind of the pacing. So you can see commands might be about three lessons. Functions might also be about three lessons. For loops could maybe be half of that functions. You get the idea of how it's 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 giving you a, almost like a, a, a lesson plan guide that you can break down, right? And it's Learn to Code 1 and Learn to Code 2, which are the resources that you download in the Swift Playgrounds app. So it's things that you can you can start to, to work with. If you are using something like Shared iPad, you can have uh, students, multiple students, using the same Swift Playgrounds app, and they can have their own Learn to Code activity. So you could have Learn to Code George, Learn to Code Martin, Learn to Code Susan, Learn to Code Gregor. It, you know, it's, it's a good way for them to, to um, get familiar with the fact that they might see other students work on their fair use, responsible use, all of these types of things come into it as we are going through. There's different tools. There's a journal you can download, which is quite good. Students can record their thoughts as they're going through. How did they feel about it? How do they um, how how do they actually you know how did they approach it? What did they find difficult? Is there a different way that they could approach it next time? So all of these. This is just a teacher guide just now. So this is things that can actually help you break it down and actually as as uh, as Susan said, kind of take ownership over the over the whole thing. You're not necessarily worried about the students just going off and playing and then what's going to happen if they get stuck. The solutions are here and how you can help them get through. How might you break it down? How might you approach it as a class? If you've got um, students with additional support needs, obviously one of the, the great things about using technology is the fact that we can approach learners of all styles. We had Accessibility Awareness Week last week where we were actually looking at how devices, you know, things like Chromebooks, things like iPads, um, iPad has is, is, is got a lot of these out of the box that are just built in, all, um, all tools, all built in features that can help support all learners of all different learning styles. They are all there and um, Swift Playgrounds also supports that. One of the great ones I'm just going to point out is that tactile uh, option there where Swift Playgrounds actually helps students learn to code via the use of uh, Braille, right? tactile layouts that correspond where students can actually um, they can actually help, you know, they can, they can get that feedback through the device so that they know whether they are tapping it in the right place. 
there's bits of uh, video that you can watch and then there's the the getting started so the first one that we get started with is learn to code one learn to code one is just uh, one of these out of the box um you know downloadable tools that you can use that also ties in with the student book and as they start to get and as they start to get going with it so for example if we go into swift playgrounds you can see there's already a few that I've got here, but down the bottom, you can see there's more playgrounds. So if I tap on Learn to Code 1, again, it does require a connection. So if your Wi-Fi is a bit uh, dodgy within class, you might want to have downloaded these just beforehand. Or if you've got digital champions within the class or within the school, it might be an idea. Once you've downloaded one of them, it becomes easy to duplicate. So if you're working on a one-to-one -one basis, it's pretty easy for students just to pick up and get going. However, if you have uh, students who are working and it's a shared iPad where multiple students are using the same devices, you might want to press and hold and you can rename. So I'm going to call this one Learn to Code Martin. You can see it renamed, so I know it's mine. Then another student might come along to duplicate it. Now, if you duplicate one, what is quite uh, uh, interesting here is that you can duplicate and reset it back to zero, or you can keep the changes that the other student worked with. So again, the, the best bit of advice here when students are working on a shared device basis is have a bit of respect for the other student's work, always start from scratch, have that bit of an, an honour system. So this one I am going to rename, and it's not Martin Copy, it's George, and I need to make sure that I highlight the fact that George would have copied me, so that's why I had to make sure that I reset it back to zero. All right. So again, these are all supplemented by students working together, right, or working individually. So I could be working in pairs going through this. We've already done the unplugged activity, so students should be pretty familiar with what a command is and how we might start to go through. So I would have them do the Learn to Code 1 command activity, following a recipe, building Lego. Right? If you don't follow the instructions, notice it doesn't say something wrong. It says something unexpected. Coding, it's never right or wrong. It's, you know, as we've seen, lots of different solutions, some of which might bring up an error. So I, I have always said to my students, oh, I, Mr. Coots, I did this wrong. No, you didn't. You just did it in such a way that was unexpected. How can we go back and fix it, right? That's a good kind of, that's a good mindset for students to get into when it comes to coding. Not that they did something wrong, but that they did something unexpected. So again, here's a command, right? If I was to talk about moving forward, what would that mean? If I wanted them to move forward more than once, I might have to employ that uh, command several times. Remember, going back to hide and seek or going back to finding the treasure. You might have to use the same command multiple times. So when you go into the first playground, you can see you have your code on the left-hand side or your space to enter code, and then you have your playground on the right-hand side. If you want, you can tap the three dots and you can have students start to uh, they can start the page over. If they've made a mistake and something's not worked, they can start over. They can take a picture. They can record a movie so they can have evidence of the work that they've done. That would then tie into a journal and they would start to document their process as they go through. So I might do this activity as a whole class and say, right, what is the purpose of this activity? We want Byte, that's the name of our character, to collect the gem. What do we need to do? We need them to move forward one, two and three okay so if we tap to enter codes you can see it gives me the code at the bottom so we want one two three what do we want them to do when he gets there we want them to collect the gem so now when we run the code okay. right so you've written your first line of swift code but Notice, if we've done that unplugged activity, if we've looked at the unplugged approach and how students are going to do things, this shouldn't be a million miles removed from what we've done unplugged. We are now beginning to see that connection between what they've done in class unplugged
to what how that looks like when it comes to writing code, right? Now, remember, this is just an introduction, so students don't necessarily need to remember what what did that say, how did it all work. It's mostly can they follow the code and can they get the instruction. This one is introducing a new one. That new one is he needs to turn left. So to begin with, he has to move forward, move forward, turn left. And he has to move forward, move forward, collect gem. Now this time, I think I'm going to make sure that I've done it. And I'm not going to spend too much time. I'm going to tap the little speed button and it will just run through quickly. Take me straight to the end and let me know that I found that I've done it right. So as students are working through this, they are also supplementing this with what's in the Everyone Can Code Puzzles Guide, where they will be looking at, they've done their hide and seek activity, they've then went in to do their commands, take it through, and at this point, they stop, right? Then we can talk about adding in a new command and we can start to build on it. Also lets you know how much you're going to actually build in. You're going to learn six steps, two turns, two actions. It's 10 commands all together. Okay? And that wasn't meant to be a pun with the 10 commandments. But it's all of these different ways that you can start to bring this stuff together. You can work through. You can then start to make it a bit more complex. Right? What about brushing your teeth? Is there something you do repeatedly? Right. Someone had said earlier about taking a photograph, repeat until you get the right one taken. All right. So hopefully I realize that's been, you know, if we were doing this as a as a face to face, there would be a bit of hands on here. But hopefully that's given you an idea of how um, how you can actually get started with unplugged activities and getting started with code. If you're if you haven't already done so, have a look at Apple Teacher. Um, Apple Teacher has some excellent resources on getting started with code, everyone can code, that supplements what we've done here. When you've got your Apple Teacher qualification, there's also one called Apple Teacher Swift Playgrounds, which gives us that little bit more info. Now, Apple Teacher isn't just designed to win a badge. The idea about Apple Teacher is that it's a chance for you as the classroom practitioner to reflect upon your practice and to develop how you might start to move forward. Because again, that's what we've, we've been, a lot of us have been doing over the past year. We've been reflecting over what a conventional lesson looks like. What is creativity in class? How does it all come in together? We've got um, some more of these coming up. Um, we obviously have the one next week, which is going to go into a bit more detail. We've kind of spoken about how we get started. So if you haven't already, I would encourage you to sign up for uh, the one on the 31st and uh, also to sign up for the one on the 7th of June where we're going to go into some keynote activities and how you can actually get started. If you want to find some more info, uh, have a look at, if you're on the, the old social medias, have a look at the uh, hashtag AppleEDU chat. Everyone can code uh, at RTC Corp. You can see I've used this slide before. Uh, it was actually meant to be Inspire SBC. Uh, it's what happens when you reuse a slide. Uh, you can look at Inspire SBC. That's uh, uh, Susan and the guys down in Scottish Borders. Um, you can follow me, MQC81. You can follow the whole team as Did You Learn Scott. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my heartfelt thanks to uh, Susan for taking the time to come and speak to us about her process and what has happened at Kingsland. My thanks to George and Louise from the team uh, helping me out at the back end with a couple of different things. And also my heartfelt thanks to all of you for taking the time and listening to me prattle on about coding over the past hour. Have a great evening. Hopefully I'll see some of you all next week. Um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thank thanks you. So much. Thank you. Have a great evening, guys. Thank you.